Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. I'm Andrew Parks, the Assistant Director of Lectures and Seminars. Uh, thank you for joining us today in the Lewis Learman Auditorium. I just wanted to take the opportunity to remind everyone attending in person to please silence your cell phones and uh, encourage anyone who's watching online to submit questions by emailing speaker at heritage.org. Additionally, today's program will be broadcast and recorded and it will be available uh, on the Heritage website for future reference. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the individual who will be conducting the interview with our featured speaker today. That is Paul Larkin. He's the Senior Legal Research Fellow in the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies here at the Heritage Foundation. Paul? Thank you. Good afternoon, gang. I want to thank you all for coming today. You have options in how you want to spend your time, and I, and I'm sure our speaker today, appreciate your willingness to spend some of that time listening to what I know will be a very valuable presentation. For most of the 20th century, federal and state law prohibited the cultivation and distribution of marijuana. Sometimes that practice was even punished rather heavily. But until the last decade of the 20th century, you could say that there was a fair consensus about how marijuana should be treated. Now, of course, it's been well established that since the 1960s, there has been an ongoing debate about how we should treat marijuana in the United States. And powerful arguments have been made on each side, some in favor of the status quo or some other form of regulation, some in favor of complete legalization. Until late in the, the 20th century, no one had ever broken through the barrier that federal and state law had. But California did in 1996 by passing the Compassionate Use Act, which allowed for the use of marijuana when recommended by a physician for medical purposes. It wound up, however, being used for far more than that. We have seen the debate continue, not just since the 60s and not just 19. 96, but even in this Congress as to how marijuana should be treated. Today's speaker, Alex Berenson, has entered into that debate. Alex Berenson is a former New York Times reporter. He started work there in 1999 after graduating from Yale College. He covered the pharmaceutical industry, amongst other things, and did two tours as a correspondent in Iraq which led him to write several fictional novels about spies that have uh, brought him a great deal of professional and critical credit. But today, he will talk about a non-fiction work of his. The title is Tell Your Children, The Truth About Marijuana, Mental Illness, and Violence. This is the book. It is on sale outside, and I urge you to get it and read it. In the book, he argues that there is a strong correlation between long-term use of marijuana and both mental illness and violence. He also maintains that we are not being told the truth about all of these problems. Now, not surprisingly, his position is a controversial one, particularly today, where you see a variety of different bills being introduced in state legislatures and in Congress to legalize marijuana. And it's also not surprising that politicians fib to us about the legislation they introduce. After all, we've been told the following in the past, quote, there is light at the end of the tunnel, unquote. Quote, I am not a crook, unquote. <laughs> and quote, if you like your health care plan, you can keep it. We also shouldn't be surprised that businesses that stand to profit from the estimated billions of dollars that can be made selling this product might not be particularly forthcoming about the potential downsides. I suppose the best and still classic example in that regard is the tobacco industry. But it is important for people to hear every side of a public policy issue. It is important for people to know the facts and the theories and the inferences before they make their own judgments about what we should do on a matter of importance like this one. Today, Heritage hopes to further that discussion and that debate by having Alex Berenson offer his remarks 
on his book, Tell Your Children the Truth About Marijuana, Mental Illness, and Violence. With that, please join me in thanking our guest to come speak today. Paul, thank you for that. Um, and if any of you start subtly checking your phones, let me know what the uh, Mueller report uh, says. Um, <laughs> Uh, so here I am in Washington uh, speaking to another conservative group, another conservative audience. Uh, you know, I, this is not what I expected uh, the three months after the publication of my book would be. Um, uh, I'm not, I'm going to take a bunch of questions from Paul and questions from the audience uh, about the book. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk right now about what the book says that much. I, I saw a number of people with it, um, and it's been out for three months, so I assume uh, some of you have read it. Uh, I hope some of you have read it. Um, uh, and Paul sort of summarized it uh, pretty, pretty accurately. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, about the media response to the book and the and the uh, and the academic left's response to the book. Um, in the last three months, uh, because that's been shocking to me. Um, I I was a New York Times reporter for more than ten years, and I think anyone who uh, looks at my body of work would be hard pressed uh, to label me as a conservative or a liberal or anything else. Um, uh, and I would say, and I was a reporter for uh, six or seven years before that. And what really uh, drew me to reporting was investigative reporting. Uh, reporters come in two main baskets: outside and inside. Uh, you know, inside reporters are the people who get people in power to talk to them, which is a valuable skill um, and one that I don't really have that well. I prefer to uh, to get people who aren't in power to talk to me um, and uh, and to look at documents um, uh, and to write stories that make companies and politicians, especially companies because I was mainly a business reporter, uncomfortable. Um, and that's what I was good at. And I don't think anyone at the paper uh, would ever say that I was anything but hard hitting and basically as accurate as humanly possible. Um, and that's what I've done in writing Tell Your Children. Uh, I've looked at a bunch of science, a bunch of studies. I've talked to a bunch of scientists. Um, I've talked to basically almost all the leaders uh, in, the, in the field of researching uh, cannabis and schizophrenia. And I collected it in a way that I think, I hope, is relatively easy to read. Um, and illustrated it with some personal narratives, not, uh, you know, narratives of families, narratives of people who'd suffered. Uh, and I think anyone who reads this book with an open mind, maybe it's not going to convince everybody, uh, but I think if you come into it with an open mind, you'd be hard pressed to say anything but that this is a serious issue, worthy of serious discussion, and should be important to the it, to the public debate around the legalization of marijuana. The book is not really about what the legal status of marijuana should be. It's about whether or not people should be informed of these risks and aware of these risks when they're using the drug. Um, and it has been incredible to me that journalists at, at everywhere, including my old newspaper, um, but most especially the Washington Post, the Washington Post especially has a lot to answer for, um, and the academic left have been, uh, they've essentially lied about the book, lied about the science, and lied about me. And I, I don't understand this. Um, it is perfectly possible to know that cannabis can cause psychosis and that psychosis carries with it a real risk of violence. Um, and both those things are beyond dispute. And to believe that the drug should be legal. Um, alcohol is legal. Tobacco is legal. Gambling is legal almost everywhere in the United States now. All three of those, uh, those substances or activities have harms, and we tolerate them. We say we're a free society and people can make their own mistakes. But we also say we're going to warn people about the risks, especially now with tobacco, and we're not going to pretend that these substances aren't dangerous. And with cannabis, we're in exactly the opposite position. We are promoting this drug. We in the media, because I still count myself as a member of the media, are promoting this drug for a bunch of medical, medical uses for which there's almost no evidence that it works. Well, at the same time, 
hiding or lying about the real psychiatric risks, the real violence, the real driving risks, the real societal risks of widespread use of this drug. And somehow, my old colleagues have convinced themselves that this is a matter of social justice, as if encouraging the most vulnerable people in society to use a drug that is dangerous for them is a good idea. When for 50 years, people you know, in vulnerable populations try to get tobacco out of their communities, try to get alcohol out of their communities. Now we are not just inviting cannabis in, but we're, we're, telling, we're telling people we want to promote it in the most marginalized populations. I, I think this is insane. Um, and, and I don't understand how, how I have been, you know, told over and over again that I'm that I'm Harry Anslinger Jr. or that I'm some conservative crusader. Again, all I can tell people is go read what I wrote for the New York Times and tell me I'm a shill for big pharma or that I'm a conservative crusader. Uh, there's, you know, nothing sacred but the truth, as the New York Observer used to say. And the book is as close to 100% accurate as I could make it. Um, and there's very, very little I would change in it uh, now after three months of scathing criticism. The only thing I would do is, and I do intend to do this for the paperback, is put in a bibliography so people can judge the science and the studies for themselves. But in the three months since it came out, there's only been more evidence of the health risks of cannabis. Um, it's a very good study from King's College London about cannabis and psychosis. There's early data from a large federal study about parental use or mother's use of cannabis and parental or and children having psychotic symptoms. Um, and that more and more of that data is going to come out because this is this study is going to go on for several years. Um, there's data from Colorado about ER admissions spiking there since 2013. Uh, and there's data about uh, cannabis use in teenage years and depression in young adulthood. All of that's come out just since January. Um, uh, and the evidence is going to continue to pile up uh, because this is, a, this is a dangerous drug. It's a recreational drug. And if we're going to legalize it, let's legalize it on those terms and let's tell people. And by the way, uh, the idea that states, and this is a secondary issue, but it is interesting, are going to get a lot of tax money for this or that this is going to be... Uh, a huge market. Also, uh, those things also seem not to be true based on the emerging experience of California, uh, because it turns out that legalization in a high tax, high regulation environment just increases the black market. Or it, it, it doesn't, I shouldn't say it increases it, but it doesn't displace it enough to be meaningful. And in fact, in California now, the regulators and some of the legalized operators are asking for more regulation against uh, the black, or, and more enforcement against the black market. Um, which is ironic since we were told that uh, legalization would reduce you know, police uh, interest in cannabis. Um, so so that's, uh, that's where I am now, three months after the book came out. Uh, I'm, I'm basically stunned by the, by the mendacity of the academic left on this book and the drug reformers on this book. Um, and... Uh, and I, and I don't really know what to do I, because I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm a political independent. I worked for the New York Times for 10 years. I'm not particularly conservative, but I will keep talking to the people who want me to talk. And it turns out that there are a lot of conservatives out there who want to know the truth about this. And if the left wants me to talk, I'll talk to them too. I'll answer any question. I'll debate anybody. But if the audiences are, if, if, if the Washington Post isn't even willing to let me write an op-ed, uh, there's not much I can do. They'll, they're happy to write op-eds bashing the book, but they won't let me and they won't review it. And that is a sad uh, commentary on where the media is right now. Um, anyway, uh, now I'm done talking and I will gladly take questions. First from Paul. Let me, on behalf of the people who've done, done you wrong this thing, way that you've described, uh, apologize, uh, because I think that's a shame that people are afraid to discuss the other side of an issue, regardless of how much you may care about it. You can only learn by talking to and listening to and reading what people who disagree with you have to say. I find conservatives sometimes make that same mistake. And I think it's a mistake, regardless of whether you're a conservative or a liberal. And so I'm sorry you've had this sort of reaction. Let me ask you. Uh, we have this 
universal recognition today that smoking cigarettes and drinking liquor can lead to numerous adverse health effects, including death. Yet marijuana is put in a different category, even when it's smoked. The advocates maintain that it has essentially no or few adverse effects, and the ones it has are minor. And it has, in fact, positive benefits. It can treat uh, disease or alleviate some of the symptoms of them. Why is that? I, I remember thinking one time, we've been spending 50 years trying to talk people out of smoking. Okay, the Surgeon General came out with a report, I think, in 64, in which he said smoking leads to cancer, emphysema, heart disease. And I don't know uh, which of the three killed my father, because he had all three of them from smoking. Why is it now, all of a sudden, marijuana is so completely different? Why are politicians treating it differently? Well, so, I mean, I think if you look at the history of cannabis um, and certainly where the modern movement came from to legalize, uh, you know, it came out of the counterculture and uh, people viewed the drug as unfairly demonized. Um, and certainly the idea that, you know, you could go to jail for a long time for possessing a few joints, I mean, that 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 didn't make a lot of sense. Um, and so for, you know, from, let's say, 1960. Five, certainly 1970 through 2000, uh, these people viewed themselves as, as rebels um, uh, promoting a, a drug that had been unfairly demonized. And if they had to shade the truth or you know, flat out lie about its benefits, they were gonna do so. And by the way, cannabis was much weaker. So, uh, so you know, smoking a 1% THC joint and using uh, ninety percent THC uh, shatter are not the same thing. Um, not to say that you can't get high off weak cannabis if you really want to, and not to say that weak cannabis can't have psychiatric effects because it can. But but the new drug is not the same as the old drug. I think there. I mean, there's increasing evidence of that. Not just because the, it has more THC, which, as I'm sure most, if not all of you, know, is the psychoactive component in cannabis and the chemical also responsible for its psychiatric risks, but it's less CBD. And CBD is the drug that, uh, or the chemical in cannabis that uh, isn't psychoactive and seems to counteract some of those risks. Um, but so that's so that's that's where advocates came from. They came from a place of, you know, I literally can be arrested in Texas and, you know, jailed for 10 years for having an ounce of pot. And, and that's not right. And we need to change that. And so, and, and, but, but here's the thing, as they've gained power, that attitude has not changed. That attitude of, we're just going to lie about the drug has not changed. And then a couple of other things happened. In 1996, California passed uh, a medical marijuana law, and it became clear to advocates that the way to get legalization was to sell the drug as medicine. This was a brilliant strategy tactically. Um, most people, even educated, whether or not they're educated, they don't really understand what medicine actually is in modern societies and, and what the process for approving a medicine and how hard that is and how much science is behind that. Um, and so, they were sort of, I think Americans are, you know, are decent people. And if you say to them, I want to be able to smoke pot when I'm dying of, you know, cancer or I have late stage HIV, you know, AIDS, um, people listen to that. And advocates realized that that was a way to, to, to get the drug quasi legalized through the back door. Um, knowing that most people who used, they, they very well knew that most people who used the drug under medical authorizations were not going to be using it for those reasons. They were going to be using it as a recreational drug that they had uh, legal protection for, thanks to an authorization. So, so, so medical marijuana happened, and that confused people about the drug. They stopped thinking of it as a drug, and they started thinking of it as this medicine. Um, and you know, as we've seen, if if this vaccine crisis in the last couple of years has taught us anything, it's that science is hard, and people unfortunately are increasingly suspicious of science. A lot of them, um, and they're suspicious of things they don't perceive as natural. Uh, and so, you know, people don't want to get their kids vaccinated. Uh, uh, you know, a growing number, and that's a, that's across the ideological spectrum. And you tell them marijuana is natural. Marijuana is a plant. Uh, honestly, if you if you if you've ever seen THC being extracted from marijuana, you'll start to wonder how natural uh, it really is. But but uh, so that's 
So, so, so we started from a place where a, a group of advocates were willing to mislead and sometimes lie about the harms of a drug. We started with a drug that was less harmful. We got medical marijuana. And then somehow uh, in, the, you know, in the 90s, advocates also started promoting marijuana legalization as a social and racial justice issue. Um, and that gained real traction with the media. The media stopped viewing this as a health and science issue, stopped viewing this as an issue of should we you know, legalize a third major intoxicant, uh, you know, a third major drug uh, in the US, um, and started thinking of this as a, health, as, a, as, a legal, as a legal issue, essentially, a racial and social justice issue. And once that happened, the media, uh, and you know, it's no secret, the center left, the, the, the elite media is center left, um, you know, and maybe, maybe in the last few years has gone further left uh, you know, in, in response to, uh, really in response to Donald Trump, but, uh, and, and probably in response to changes in the Republican Party and Fox News. So the, so the, center, you know, the center left media has gone left left and, and marijuana has been sold as an issue, a progressive issue. And so the people who should have been considering this, the people who should have been pushing back on the people making these ridiculous claims about cannabis' health benefits and about its lack of psychiatric dangers, instead got on board the train. And so there has been nobody, basically, aside from a few people, um, you know, as I, uh, Sam is a tiny group, uh, and and a few other, you know, that smart approaches to marijuana. Yes, um, uh, uh, a few other people out there pushing back. I, I say, and it's true, I should not have been able to write this book. Okay, this book doesn't talk about much that wasn't in the public domain already. There's some original research in it, but but not enough for a book. The reason I could write this book and the reason people are freaking out about the book is because it takes a bunch of stuff that really is incontrovertible scientifically and has been signed off on by some of the most august scientific bodies and researchers, not just in the US, but in the world, and presents it as if it's fact, because it is fact. And so, and so the media hasn't done its job and advocates have capitalized on that by pushing further and further. And so the public is, of course, confused. It's, it's, and by the way, I actually don't think this is really, this, politicians have not led this movement. The Democratic Party has not led this movement. It's, I mean, they're leading it now, but they're doing that in response to the fact that 65% of the country you know, supposedly favors legalization. And even if you, say, if you try to factor out who wants full legalization, who wants uh, uh, you know, medical legalization, you still get big numbers, numbers that politicians are going to pay attention to. But it's, this has not been led by politicians. This is politicians following the public opinion, and the public opinion has been led by the media. This is a failure of the media, first and foremost. And I, I don't just say that because I'm a former reporter. I, I say it because you can, you, can, you can trace the spread of the disease. You mentioned uh, social and racial justice. Two of the arguments that are made against marijuana use today are the following. First, it was adopted in 1937. That is, the federal law, the Marijuana Tax Act of 37, was adopted because of racist fears of Mexicans in the United States strung out on ganja. And regardless of what the uh, intent of the Congress was when it adopted the law in 37, it has a racially disproportionate effect on blacks and other minorities in the United States today because of the enforcement of these laws. How do you respond to those arguments? So Harry Anslinger was racist. Okay, I mean, who's gonna argue that? I, it doesn't, it's irrelevant. Uh, you know, uh, Carter Glass was racist, but that's irrelevant to Glass-Steagall. Um, the, the science is what it is. Um, Anslinger may not have, you know, he died long before these studies came out, but the studies have come out and they've shown that he was correct. Cannabis causes psychosis and psychosis causes violence. That's not a racial issue. Psychosis can affect black people, white people, Hispanic people, it can affect anybody. The harms that marijuana causes affect everybody. And I'm not gonna be afraid to say that. Uh, so, so as for the, you know, this question about arrests, it's unquestionably true that black and Hispanic people are arrested more frequently for cannabis use in the U.S. Um, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, 
and I don't favor arrest for marijuana possession and use. Uh, I think the drug should be decriminalized because effectively it already has been decriminalized. We might as well acknowledge that fact. Um, it's important to remember though, whether it's decriminalized or even fully legalized, there will still be arrests for marijuana possession and use. There are arrests in Colorado. There will be arrests for underage use. There will be arrests for use in public. There will be arrests for marijuana use. And if the Colorado data is any indication, they will continue to fall more heavily on blacks and Hispanics. The, the, we have racial and social disparities in this country. And whether marijuana is legal or not, we're going to have those disparities. And legalization is not the answer to those disparities, in my opinion, because it doesn't really change anything. Uh, legalization just makes a recreational intoxicant legal. The real question about this is whether or not we want to encourage or discourage use, not what the legal status of the drug needs to be. One of the problems you mentioned in your book is the risk of drug-impaired driving. And I think you mentioned it just a few minutes ago, too. Uh, there's going to be a certain number of people who use marijuana, become intoxicated, and then get behind a wheel. How big a problem is that? And w if it is a big problem, why haven't we heard more about it? Well, why haven't you heard more about marijuana and psychosis? Yes, it's a big problem. Um, it's, it's not clear uh, how big a problem. It's, pro it's not as big a problem as alcohol and driving, it seems. Um, but I will say a couple of things. The lab studies don't carry marijuana's, in but don't catch marijuana's impact on violence because uh, because the impact on violence is so tied to psychosis. And you actually have to screen out people who use, uh, who have a tendency to become psychotic from lab studies of marijuana's effects because it's unethical to subject them to a drug that could make them get psychotic. So what that means is that when, you, when you're looking at whether marijuana makes people more aggressive in a lab, most of the time you find that it doesn't. Whereas you can clearly show that alcohol tends to make people more aggressive in lab settings. And that has led to confusion about marijuana's effects in the real world. I think some of the same thing is true for driving. I think that some of the violence or the, the driving risk is mediated around psychosis. Um, psychosis obviously is not a good thing in any setting and it's not a good thing when you're behind the wheel of a you know, two ton car or, or 20 ton truck. Um, uh, at the same time, there's some evidence that marijuana and alcohol um, are synergistic uh, so, that, so that people who have a couple of drinks and might be okay to drive, not great to drive, but okay to drive if they then use uh, cannabis, perhaps under the mistaken assumption that it won't hurt their driving, it winds up hurting their driving. In any case, the real world numbers are clear. In Colorado, there were 58 deaths in which people had uh, cannabis or THC in their blood, fatal accidents in, I believe, 2013. In 2017, there were 139. That's an increase of about 250%, a little bit less, uh, I'm sorry, 150%, a 2.5x increase post-legalization. Uh, we don't have great data nationally because we don't have great uh, drug testing for fatal accidents nationally, but that all by itself is a striking number. Um, why haven't you heard that number? Because, because the Denver Post doesn't like writing about the problems that cannabis causes. Because the Washington Post doesn't like writing about the problems that cannabis causes. Because the Los Angeles Times doesn't like writing about the problems cannabis causes. Because NPR won't even have me on to debate my book. Okay, You haven't heard about it because you haven't heard about it. But it, it's a real number. And it's from the Colorado, it's, you know, it's from the state of Colorado's report on marijuana's impacts. And all I can tell you is, now you've heard it, but a lot of other people haven't. One last question, and then I'm going to uh, offer the audience the opportunity to ask questions. Last year, an estimated 70,000 people overdosed and died from one opioid or another. It's uh, been described as an epidemic. It also has been described as a metastatic cancer, and the latter, I think, probably is a more accurate description. Should we legalize marijuana as an alternative painkiller for acute or chronic pain to deal with this problem so that we get people smoking marijuana rather than using opioids? So unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of hope that marijuana uh, can work as an alternative painkiller to opioids. There's effectively no evidence that marijuana works in chronic pain, um, even though 
the National Academy of Medicine uh, said that it did. And even though there's a white and there's a meta-analysis published in JAMA from 2015 that said it did, unfortunately, there is significant more recent data that contradicts that. Um, studies conducted by the same company that's conducted the original studies uh, that, that are quoted in JAMA and in the National Academy report. Um, that's why, by the way, and I'm sure everyone in this room can imagine the market for a non-opioid painkiller that was effective. It would be in the billions, possibly the tens of billions of dollars. And there's a company called GW Pharma. It's a serious pharmaceutical company based in Britain. It's the company that makes Epitalex, which is the CBD drug for, uh, for epilepsy that, uh, that's been approved by the FDA. And GW Pharma has spent 15 years trying to show that a mix of CBD and THC called Sativex, could work in chronic pain. And they effectively have abandoned that effort, and so have a couple other drug companies that were working with them, because three studies in 2015 showed that cannabis did not work for chronic pain. As far as I can tell, and I've looked, there's only ever been one study comparing uh, a, a THC product, a THC analog called Navalone, in this case, to any... Um, any pain uh, to any opioid painkiller. So when you hear that cannabis works in pain, the studies are almost all against placebo, which is which is barely ethical anyway, because we have painkillers that work. And I'm not just talking about opioids. Tylenol is a painkiller. Uh, you know, uh, 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 ibuprofen is a painkiller. Aspirin is a painkiller. In general, cannabis has not been tested against active comparators in clinical trials, either smoke cannabis or THC. In one trial, uh, I think it was about 10 years ago, uh, this Nabilone, which is, which is a stronger synthetic uh, THC analog, meaning a, a drug that affects your brain the way THC does, but more powerfully, was tested against an opioid called dihydrocodone, which is actually a weak opioid. Dihy dihydrocodone was stronger in a statistically significant way than Nabilone. Cannabis doesn't work for chronic pain. I, it's actually kind of surprising to me that it doesn't work for chronic pain because alcohol sort of works for chronic pain or at least works in the short term for pain um, a little bit. It's a little bit of an analgesic, but the evidence is that cannabis actually doesn't. Um, I don't know. I don't know why that is. And um, I wish it weren't true. I wish that we could tell people who are using opioids to use cannabis because cannabis, uh, you know, obviously doesn't carry the same risk of overdose and death as opioids, but the clinical trials and a big Australian study that came out last year called the POINT study all show the same thing, which is that cannabis is not an effective substitute for opioids in pain. Um, and I think, we'll see, but I think at some point somebody's going to do a new meta-analysis, and unfortunately that's, we'll see what they find, but it would be hard for me to believe, given the null results on the newer studies, that they're going to find that cannabis works for pain. So, so this is, it's unfortunately not a solution. It's a problem, and it sounds like a good solution, but it's not a solution. Okay, I'll now take questions from the audience. Oh, let me just say the ground rules. First, please identify yourself by name and organization, and please ask a question. And making a speech, and then at the end saying, do you agree with me, is not a question. <laughs> Okay, and also try to keep it brief so we can get as many, you know, as we possibly can. Sir, you in the gray, uh, you'll be next. Um, Al Milliken, AM Media. <clears throat> Aside from our current president, who seems like uh, substance abuse or usage has never been an issue, our m previous three most recent presidents all acknowledged some degree of substance abuse or use I was curious, what kind of influence do you think that has on our U.S. society? And, and one thing in particular, I, I've met one of Bill Clinton's classmates from Oxford who said it was technically true. He didn't inhale, but he said they used it in brownies, which actually had a more potent, powerful effect than if he had smoked it. Um, that's a good question. I, you know, I think probably that encourages people to think of use as not particularly harmful. And let's be honest, you know, most people can use cannabis and not suffer psychosis. And even if they, you know, for that minority of people who have a psychotic episode, most people aren't going to develop schizophrenia. Um, 
But most people can use cocaine once and not become addicted, right? If, if 20 or 25% of people who use once become addicted, that means 75 or 80% don't become addicted after one use. Um, that doesn't mean we should be encouraging the use of any of this stuff. Um, it means that people, we need to figure out what to do to discourage use and what to do to, with people who are going to, you know, wind up using whether or not we like it. Uh, pretending that cannabis is medicine is both the greatest tactical move the uh, industry ever made and advocates ever made and uh, a disaster for U.S. public health. And that's had way more impact, I think, than whether or not, you know, Bill Clinton did or didn't inhale or... Uh, or Barack Obama was in the, you know, was a, was a smoker. Sir? Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Carlos Savillon. Um, I'm an economist, a journalist. Um, you said that 65% of the population, and I saw that poll last year that said that it, they thought there was no harm with ma marijuana, and uh, you blame it on the liberal press. And sure, I've seen a lot of articles in that direction. But the, the thing is that um, the lower you go in ages, let's say teenagers or 20-somethings, the higher the percentage of thinking that there's no harm. And that group of young people are little influenced by the press because they're not into reading much about politics or whatever. So how did such a high percentage of perhaps 80% of teenagers get to think that there's no harm? And, 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 and I, 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 sure. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I would agree that millennials are not interested in politics or reading the media. Um, they seem pretty interested in it right now to me. Uh, I mean, I think in general, young people, look, you get older and you see the harms that drugs can cause in your own life and in other people's lives. Um, and so you become more wary of them. I think that's very natural. Um, what's interesting is that the number of people who use cannabis in a year has not risen that much in the US, okay? So, so it was about 25 million in 2005 and it's about 40 million in 2017, the number of people used once. Okay, it's not alcohol. People do not use it every day. I mean, a lot of people do. I'm sorry, a lot of people are not using it, okay? 85% of the country, adults did not use in 2017. People are getting their information about this from the media. And and beyond that, I think there's a, it's, it's fascinating to me because I've obviously I've heard from a lot of users since the book came out. And even people who, you know, sometimes they'll say, I had a bad experience or I really felt myself kind of sliding into trouble with this and I didn't, I didn't connect it to the drug or I thought it was just me. When, when a whole culture is telling you this is not dangerous, this can be helpful for your depression and you use it and, you know, like any intoxicant in the three hours or six hours that you're intoxicated, you feel a little bit better then, you know, you wake up the next morning, you feel worse again, and you feel worse than you did the day before, you would think that making that connection would be relatively easy. But when people are being gaslit by a whole culture, it's hard for them. And when, the, when one of the effects of the drug is to sort of impair your ability to see your own relationship with the world, it becomes even harder. So, so the people who understand the drug the best have a real problem seeing its effects. And then sometimes they wake up and they do. And I, you know, I've heard from some of those people. Um, but it's not surprising to me that a lot, you know, that, that support is highest among the young. Uh, you know, that would be, that, that's always been true. And as the baseline increases, the baseline among young users is gonna to increase too. Uh, right here in front. But we'll bring a mic to you. Yeah, my name is Steve Alm. I'm a retired judge from Hawaii and creator of Hope Probation. One digression, if anyone here hasn't read Mr. Berenson's novels, they're the best spy <laughs> novels out there. Thank you. Uh, my question is, as you touched on it, the fact that uh, a lot of marijuana today is so much stronger than what it was back in the 60s, 70s, how much of the problem that you're pointing to regarding psychosis and otherwise is directly related to the potency? You know, it's a really good question. Uh, I don't think we have a good answer for that yet. Uh, the studies on which the book is based are mostly uh, from a period when cannabis was weaker. 
uh, you know, most of the studies are pre-2000, certainly pre-2010, and that would suggest that this is a bigger problem. Now, advocates will say, well, you know, really the strong stuff just means people can smoke less of it, uh, you know, they can titrate it a little more easily. Um, I, if, if the evidence is as strong as it seems to be, and by the way, there, you know, again, this King's College London paper that came out in Lancet Psychosis um, in March had a 5x risk ratio for daily use of what they called high potency cannabis, which is, you know, standard cannabis in the U.S. now. Um, if that number is real, um, I, I think we're going to see population level impact sooner than we might think. Um, and, and by the way, that will be a disaster. It will be a disaster, obviously, for users and their families, but it will be a disaster societally. The police aren't really ready to deal with it either. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the short answer is we don't know, but, there, but there's a lot of indicators flashing red. Let me, can I just follow up and it, with a personal experience in that regard? Uh, so about three years ago when I started getting more involved in drug policy, I thought marijuana was probably not more harmful than alcohol. I think President Obama said that, and I thought, yeah, that sounds about right. Then I was at a conference, and I listened to a professor by the name of Hoover Adger, who is the uh, chief of pediatric medicine at Johns Hopkins Medical School and Hospital. And I asked him that question. And he said, the problem is the potency of today's marijuana is so much greater than what it was in the 60s and 70s that studies done back then no longer afford a reliable indication of what the effect would be from people using it. And I started looking into it, and that's when I found out that the potency had gone up from, say, 3% to, in some cases, 90-plus uh, percent and close to 100. And uh, I'm not a, a scientist, but I know that when you change the uh, principal ingredient, that is the principal psychoactive ingredient in a substance, it's going to have uh, possibly a, a very, very different effect when it becomes more potent and start looking into it. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people sort of got lulled into thinking this is the same old ganja that they used to smoke in college. Uh, it's not. Uh, the woman there with the uh, brown uh, dress. Hi, um, I'm Casey. I'm with the Addiction Policy Forum. Just uh, one clarification. The 70,000 people who died, it's actually all drug overdoses. So it's important, I think, as we're discussing drug policy to note that they're high across the board. Like, we've seen increases from cocaine, methamphetamine. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, just two quick questions. One, I, you, we touched upon this. Um, edibles, with the um, Denver study you cited, they accounted for 10% of the ER visits, but they actually are like such a minute um, part of the, um, the market. Yes. What do you think of this threat of edibles? And then two, do you think people are very confused over decriminalization and legalization? Um, because that seems to be what the issue is. Yeah, I mean, edibles are clearly a problem, even for experienced users. Uh, you know, it's funny, I was on a plane uh, talking to a woman who was a you know, poly drug user, regular cannabis user, <laughs> who, by the way, told me, I, you know, she said, well, I, I don't think, I think marijuana should be legal. By the way, I probably didn't marry the guy I was dating for five years because he was a user. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, this is somebody who's been sort of directly negatively affected by this, who's still thinks it's fine. Um, but so she, you know, she recounted the experience of, of having an edible and being quasi psychotic for, uh, for 18 hours. Um, and I think, and I think that's quite common among people who use edibles. Uh, they're just hard to titrate. Um, and they're, you know, sometimes you don't know how big the dose is. And even if you know, you should wait before taking a second dose. Some people don't. So, uh, so that's a real risk. Um, your second question, oh, decrim oh yeah, so I think people, yeah, people don't understand that um, decriminalization versus, they, they don't understand what medical marijuana is. People often ask me, well, you're in favor of medical marijuana, right, even if you're not in favor of recreational. I say the two drugs are exactly the same. Um, uh, and they don't understand decrim versus legalization. They don't understand that there's a way to say, you know what, we're not going to put people in jail for this. We're not even going to arrest anybody who's a user. We're just going to not have an industry promoting this. Um, and then the third major, and by the way, both of those confusions are confusions that the marijuana lobby 
actively encourages. The third confusion that the marijuana act lobby actively encourages is CBD versus THC. So, you know, people don't, they, people now think, plenty of them, that they can actually buy marijuana at, you know, at the local Rite Aid because you can go in and see a CBD product with a leaf on it. And, um, you know, CBD is not THC, but people are busy and they have lots of stuff in their lives to worry about. And they think this, you know, balm for their, uh, you know, dog's arthritis is what their kid is upstairs smoking uh, every morning. And that, you know, of all, that's yet another terrible thing that the industry has done is to promote this confusion. Um, so, you know, sometimes I feel like I am just so busy trying to get out basic truths that, you know, to argue any of the more complicated stuff is next to impossible. Down here in front. Uh, there'll be somebody brings you a, a microphone. Very much. I'm Bob Dupont, and I'm just proud to be here and appreciate the presentation. I want to bring up one thing: uh, marijuana is a long-term issue, but you notice it's changed its name to cannabis, and there's a reason for that to get away from the hippie background, and it's become commercialized in a way that was unfathomable, unbelievable, and I think the commercialization has changed the whole game in a very uh, profound way. And what we've seen in past uh, of these debates is nothing compared to where we're going to go. And you also mentioned about the liberal. There's a quite a large conservative group of people who are supporting yeah. uh, legalization of marijuana, too. But I particularly want to ask you to think about that commercial, or speak about that commercialization, which is Altria just invested $15 billion in uh, marijuana and vaping, yes. uh, that that's changing the game. So, so I, I mean, it's interesting because I was talking to a friend of mine who's a you know an investor uh, a, a few days ago, and he said, you know, you always you know you talk about the the sort of the the policy aspect of this, and you forget about the money, and you shouldn't forget about the money. Um, and you're right, Bob, and he's right. The, the money does make a difference, um, uh, and. You know, I I think this has been led by policy, uh, you know, by wonks and think tanks. But the fact that people now have skin in the game is going to make it even harder and make the lies even bigger. And they're going to find researchers who will, uh, either for ideological reasons or just for for money, will spout their line. I mean, that's what tobacco did. We know it. It went on and on and on. Um, and it's one reason why it took. You know, 40 years after scientists really started to to coalesce around the idea that tobacco is dangerous for us as a as a society to reach that consensus. So I think I think you're right. Um, again, it's like I can only find so many people at once, but uh, but but you're right. Woman down in front. There'll be somebody bringing you a microphone. Yes, I'm Paula Gordon. Nice to meet you, and nice to see you here. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, I uh, have a website called GordonDrugAbusePrevention.com, and I'm also an educator and teach online courses for Auburn University Outreach on marijuana and on the drug crisis. My question it has to do with um, the, the so-called priming of the brain or the sensitization of the brain. Uh, to marijuana, and this has been shown, amongst other um, uh, research, to occur, um, both animal and um, uh, human research, to occur in the brains of uh, fetuses uh, who have been exposed in utero to marijuana, both animal fetuses and human fetuses. These are fetuses that have been aborted or uh, have uh, been uh, miscarried. Um, and there have been control groups about this too. And this carries on through uh, adolescence, evidently. And uh, I wonder what you're, if you're going to be including something like that. I only listened to your book in this audio form, but I didn't hear that so mentioned. So, uh, you know, so I think the science is emerging around this. Um, and, you know, I wanted to stick to places where the science was really strong. Uh, I do think this data, this early data uh, from the ABCD study is, is certainly concerning. Um, uh, 
you know, my bigger issue around cannabis and parenting is what I like to call uh, the promotion of cannabis impaired parenting um, by the uh, by the Washington Post first and foremost, which in the last five months has written three stories by people or published three you know articles, uh, op eds or 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 opinion perspective pieces by people claiming that cannabis makes them better parents. Um, given. <laughs> I mean, if, if they, you know, I, I realize that, they, that people sometimes talk about, you know, wine o'clock and, you know, Chardonnay mommies or whatever, but there, but there's always a little bit at least of, uh, of you know, shame around this, uh, which is not unreasonable because I'm the parent of two young kids. And, and listen, I, I, I don't think that alcohol makes me a better parent. Um, and I don't think that cannabis would make me a better parent, but it's actually much worse than that. There's very good statistical evidence um, from... There are three states that I know of, at least, there may be more, but there are at least three large states that do very good studies on the drug use by the caregivers or parents of children who've died from abuse or neglect. Every state is supposed to do this. Not every state does it very well. Texas, Florida, and Arizona do do it well. And those three states show that cannabis use or at the time of or a history of cannabis abuse is the by far the most common drug that the parents or caregivers of these abused children, these children who died from abuse or neglect are using. About one third, somewhere between one third and 40% of child deaths occur at the hands of parents who are using or have a history of abuse of cannabis. That is more than any other drug by far. It's more than alcohol. It's way more than the use of cannabis in the population, even by groups that are likely to be, you know, hurting their, you know, younger, more marginalized populations. There is no way around the fact that cannabis use pops up in a large fraction of child deaths. And for the Washington Post to encourage the use of cannabis by the parents of young children is, I'm not going to say it's a crime, but it is a journalistic crime. And, you know, I've done everything possible on my Twitter feed to call them on it. Uh, but, you know, they prefer to ignore me. Okay. Uh, down in front here, uh, they'll bring you a microphone. Just hold on. Thanks. Um, I'm a healthcare reporter with Modern Healthcare, and I did a story in October on looking at maternal use of marijuana. And what I found was a huge disconnect between it within the medical community over this, where it's the OBGYNs, the pediatricians really, you know, they don't like it. Yeah. On it. Yeah. Um, and then they're saying that there's kind of a suppression of, of research that they want to do. Can you talk a little more about where the medical community plays in? Because they seem to also play into on the policy side. You know, they're not really calling out state legislatures to address the public health implications. Sure. Uh, so so the, the pediatricians have been a little bit more aggressive. Um, uh, the AMA has you know, really not said anything. It said very little. The APA, the American Psychiatric Association, you know, my wife is a psychiatrist. Um, they've, you know, they they just don't want to get involved. And they're going to have to because their members are going to see too many cases of psychosis um, for them not to get involved at some point. Why the medical bodies have not been more aggressive, I don't know. People still do respect and listen to doctors. Uh, you know, I can just tell you firsthand if you speak up about this, you are vilified. And it becomes, for me, it's an all-consuming issue right now. Um, now, I have a book that, you know, so, so in some ways I have to defend myself and my book. But if you're an MD, you know, a psychiatrist, a, a pediatrician, you have, you have patients to take care of. You have clinical responsibilities. You have journals to read. You have an office to run and, you know, insurers to fight with. You can't spend all your time getting yelled at by people in the cannabis lobby. And those people... You know, they haven't been willing to, to stick up, you know, the nail that sticks up gets pounded down. Well, you know, I'm going to fight right back, but I, I get why they don't want to be in this. Um, but it, they're going to have to, and I hope they do, and the sooner the better. The fellow in the back. Uh, hello, I'm Michael Sheminar. I'm a research assistant at the Cato Institute. We had an event on harm reduction about a month back. And uh, one of the speakers was uh, Adrienne Wilson-Poe, and she presented on research that seemed to show that 
um, cannabis and opioids could act as complements in pain reduction. So perhaps no, they don't work. Perhaps opioids are much more effective relative to cannabis, but it might allow to give smaller doses of opioids and therefore help possibly prevent um, dependence. So have you looked into this at all? I, I don't know the study that she presented, but I can tell you there's, there's not, so beyond the fact that, uh, you know, cannabis doesn't seem to be effective on its own uh, and beyond the fact that, you know, this large Australian study from last year showed that people who used cannabis wound up having higher use of opioids. And this was a four-year study of more than a thousand people. It's a pretty good study. Uh, there's a study from the JAMA Psychiatry, I think published it uh, early in 2018, showing that people who used cannabis were three times as likely to be using opioids three years later. Um, the real world evidence on this is that if you give people an addictive recreational drug or encourage them to use an addictive recreational drug, they wind up using other addictive recreational drugs. I don't understand why that would be confusing to people, um, and, and especially especially since uh, you know cannabis doesn't really work as a painkiller. Um, you know, so so I don't think there's very good evidence. Although I have to acknowledge I have not seen the data that she presented. Oh, Kevin Sabat has a comment. You have a clarification on that. Yeah. Again, quickly, uh, Kevin Sabet, president of SAM. So it's a great question. And actually, last week, the Journal of Addiction Medicine just published a study showing that it was looking at that exact question of complements and does it help together. And it said that, and I'm reading from the article, sufferers from chronic pain who use marijuana in conjunction with prescription opioids demonstrated higher instances of mental health issues and further substance use problems than those who used opioids alone. Uh, they controlled for multiple things, and then they found that uh, uh, instances of depression, anxiety, as well as opioid addiction, alcohol and cocaine use were higher in patients who used both drugs. Additionally, there was no reported difference in pain for either groups. That was last week. And, and, and I think that's a naturalistic study, right? In other words, they just looked at a group of people. So, so you know, so again, that's not going to be quite as strong as it's certainly not as strong as a randomized control trial, but it's not, you know, it's not as strong necessarily as looking at a group of people over a course of a couple of years, but it's more evidence of this. And by the way, the best evidence of this is in the biggest uncontrolled study of all, which is in the United States and Canada, which are the two countries that have the most cannabis use in the West by far and have the worst opioid epidemics by far. And that even goes to, you know, British Columbia, you know, on a province, a provincial basis in Canada. BC has a terrible problem with opioids and opioid deaths, and it has the most aggressive community of cannabis users, maybe anywhere in the world, maybe Colorado, San Francisco, BC. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, in the real world, getting people to use cannabis has not gotten them away from opioids. Woman in green. Hi, thanks. I'm Lisbeth Portman from the Addiction Policy Forum. Um, one of the most powerful parts of your book was you walking us through the shift in your own thinking about this drug, and that you kind of credit to a story from someone you trust, aka your, your wife's lived experience, followed by inarguable evidence. And given the what you call like the shock of the past three months, and of not being able to have a platform in these kind of powerful news outlets. What does that kind of transition from story to evidence and your, your surprise lead you to believe about actually changing people's minds and what we need in, yeah, what we need in terms of storytelling right now? Um, so, so that's a great question. Uh, I think, you know, as, so cannabis legalization, one of the great, uh, you know, the, the, the great, planks that, that, that legalizers used was the stories of the parents of kids, you know, young kids with epilepsy, uh, you know, who, who supposedly or in some cases actually had gotten relief from THC or CBD, um, again, alighting the difference between the two. Uh, when, the, when the mothers and fathers of, of, you know, adult children who were in college or, you know, had successfully graduated high school and were working and then lost their minds and in some cases their lives to, uh, you know, to the psychosis that cannabis can produce, when those people start speaking loudly, there will be a change. 
when the and when the you know when the medical society starts saying this is real, we are seeing this. There will be a change. Um, the media is going to have to. I mean, I, I, I say they're going to have to, meaning both they should, and it will only happen if they broadcast those voices. But I would like to believe that my colleagues are not so far gone that they will not listen to the lived experiences of people who have, you know, who have suffered themselves or whose families have been racked by this, um, even if they don't want to listen to me. Uh, but it's going to be a while, I think. Um, you know, if you're if you're a betting person, you're going to bet that cannabis becomes legal in this country. Certainly, if there's a Democrat elected in 2020, there's great likelihood of full national legalization. And then there's going to be a large, powerful, well-financed group of people who are going to do everything possible to make it hard to hear these stories or to put them in context. Um, but but it will happen one you know one person at a time and the more parents and by the way this is hard right it's hard in, especially if your child is still alive right if your child is 30 and on the street somewhere and you're still hoping against hope that you know he or she is going to come back from this um, and so so in some ways it's going to be the parents of children who died who who are going to be the loudest voices um, the science is incontrovertible. Uh, you know, we can argue about risk ratios and we can argue about who's vulnerable here and how vulnerable, but there is too much evidence now of harm for it to be, it's not going to go away. So, so it's just a question of how long uh, it takes and, and how willing the media is to listen to the reality. We have an opportunity maybe for one more question. Sir, check shirt. Yep. Hi, my name's Mike. Um, is there is there a correlation between uh, the user psychosis if the parent has schizophrenia? Uh, yeah, so you're clearly at higher risk for schizophrenia if you have a parent or a close family member, um, and that risk translates into a higher risk if you're gonna if you're using cannabis. You have a higher base risk, and so you have a higher multiplied risk. Um, whether it's you know precise, whether it's sort of as precise as that, I I couldn't I don't think we know yet. But there's definitely a higher risk. And by the way, that's something, you know, if the Drug Policy Alliance were more honest, we could have a conversation that said, let's try to warn vulnerable populations about this. If you have a first degree relative who's mentally ill, maybe you shouldn't use. If you're having strange thoughts, you know, upon using, certainly if you wind up in the ER because of paranoia or, you know, or auditory hallucinations or whatever, you shouldn't use. You shouldn't use this drug as a long-term treatment for your psychiatric conditions. You shouldn't be thinking that it's an anti-anxiety medicine you should use for six months on end. There are, there are ways to warn that don't just say, don't ever use this. But, but the DPA and the other advocates, and certainly the, you know, the, the for-profit companies, aren't going to have that conversation unless they're forced to. That's, that's, that's one thing that's become clear to me in the last three months. Listen. Please join me in thanking Alex Berenson for coming and talking about his book. Well, thank you, Paul, for having me. Thank you. My pleasure. The Institute for Behavior and Health and Smart Approaches to Marijuana are full partners with Heritage on this event. I want to thank them for their contributions and their assistance as well. Please join me in giving them a hand as well. Gang, we are adjourned.